Okay, so um, welcome back, everybody. Um, uh, tonight's our, our final uh, session, and as I was uh, telling Maxine before we began, uh, I think that tonight's material is the most fun out of the material that we're going to be talking about. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, questions of reincarnation and um, of uh, a kind of a, a, a transformation, a question of, of the status of humankind in relationship to all of reality. And so in some ways, uh, this might stuff, this might feel like the least relatable of the material that we've looked at. Um, I mean, maybe everybody here uh, believes in uh, reincarnation, but it's not so common in uh, in Western circles. But um, I think that some of the ways that this is going, that we're going to be talking about it, the texts that we're going to be looking at are going to talk about it, will ref will touch on ways of thinking about our world and thinking about the status of a human being in relationship to other creatures that will have a, an interesting similarity. So just to reflect back to uh, last week for a moment, what are we closed with the last part of last week's class, we read uh, parts of an extensive discussion of reincarnation uh, as presented in the Zohar. And there in the Zohar, the only time it appears that one undergoes reincarnation was if one had gotten, and it's speaking from a male perspective, if one had gotten married, uh, had not fathered a child and died. And in such a case, because of that lack of continuity of identity, the uh, uh, the biblical obligation of yibum kicks in, and uh, in leveret marriage, the a brother-in-law has to is supposed to marry the the widow. And what the Zohar does with that is that it suggests that the the new child that is born is in some way the original husband. And to complicate matters further, it suggests that the original husband had the deceased husband had infused some of his own soul into his wife and so that now uh when the this new couple the brother-in-law and the widow uh, have sexual relations there it, there end up being three people or three different spiritual entities that are somehow contained within her womb that there is the deceased husband the the residue of his former presence there is the new child which is a a distinct presence but is somehow related to this to this uh the deceased and uh the uh the new um uh, and the new husband as well the brother-in-law as well and so you get this kind of triple identity of this new child that is the result of the the conception here and uh the zohar is sort of baffled it doesn't know what to do with it um, to 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 uh, bring that into the present for a moment. Uh, a number of years ago, I was looking into issues around um, the halacha of uh, infertility and of uh, donor egg situations. And uh, Rabbi J. David Blake of, of YU, who's you know the, one of the leading post game uh, today. Um, argued that in a case of donor, and oh, so let me just sort of fill it in. In a case of donor egg, where a uh, the gestating mother, the birth mother is unable to have a, does not have fertile eggs. So a donor egg is, is implanted in her that, uh, uh, that or sorry, a, a donor egg is contributed after IVF uh, completed conception with the father. And uh, J. David Bleich uh, argued, in contrast to those who said, well, the birth mother is the halachic mother, or the, the donor mother is the halachic mother, J. David Bleich argued that both of them are the mother, and that this child now has two mothers, which creates all kinds of halachic uh, ramifications that we're not going to go into. But it's just interesting that the Zohar was troubled by the metaphysics 
And here, J. David, J. David Blythe was creating a, a somewhat similar situation where there were two mothers um, to this for this particular child. Okay, so um, uh, let's, uh, let's take a look at our material tonight. Let's get this going here. Okay, so the first thing that we need to uh, mention, this is just sort of the most basic building blocks uh, for what we're gonna be talking about this evening is that in already going back to Aristotle, there is a notion that the human soul is comprised of three parts. And uh, the medievals uh, absorb this. You can find this in Maimonides' commentary on uh, his, uh, his essay entitled Shmona Prakim. It's his introduction to his commentary on the Tractate of Vote. Um, and uh, the Kabbalists absorb this as well. Uh, it's actually more complicated than the picture that you see right now. Very often they'll talk about five components. We're just going to, we just need to be familiar with three components for what we're going to learn tonight. And these are nefesh, which is often translated as a vital force or a kind of an animal soul, meaning that it is something that is akin to animals. It's like the same vitality that my cat has that it wants to you know, it wants to uh, eat and it wants to sleep. It wants to have sex. It wants to, uh, it has to, uh, you know, uh, eliminate waste. All of those things are the 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 animating force or something that is that makes up the nefesh. There's a distinctly human uh, component to the soul called the ruach or the spirit. And then finally, there is a neshama, which is considered to be the highest of these three. And you can see the uh, the plurals down there. We'll be referring to this in both singular and plural. So where I want to start is with a Midrash from Shmot Rabbah. Um, Shmot Rabbah is a, a slightly, a somewhat later uh, Midrash. Um, I mean, it's not super late, it's late antiquity. And I'm just going to read the English for time's sake, but it says, while the first Adam, right, Adam that was created in the garden, was still arrayed as an inert body, as a golem, the Blessed Holy One showed him each and every righteous person that would emerge from him. There were those who hung from the head of Adam. There were those who hung from his hair. There were those who hung from his forehead, from his eyes, from his nose, and from his earlobes. So what is this what, what, what is this Midrash trying to tell us? And what we have to be thinking about are two different planes of meaning. We have to be thinking about both what the rabbis might have been thinking about and then what the Kabbalists are thinking about. So for the rabbis, it would appear that they are imagining all human souls are in some sense preconceived. I don't mean conceived in a physiological sense, but that they were imagined or that they were already designated by God. And why then attach them to associate them with different rungs of the body? Uh, I would assume that it's because there are there's a kind of a hierarchy here. Is if, if you're going to come from some part of the body of Adam, of Adam that first human being, I don't want to come from the top of his head. I would not want to come from, you know, from nether parts or his toes or, you know, what have you. Um, but there is an interesting level of detail here is how would you distinguish whether you wanted to come from, got, you know, Adam's earlobes or from his nostrils or from, you know, what have you. So let's now jump ahead from, say, the fourth or fifth century up until the 16th century. But when in the 16th century in Sfat, where Isaac Luria is the most becomes the most famous Kabbalist, uh, and his writings are disseminated by his primary disciple Chaim Vital, um, he turns this into a into a huge myth. And by myth, I just mean a grand story. I don't mean uh, that it's not you know that it's not true. And they take, in a certain sense, he takes it very literally, is that all of the souls that were going to be created, and he talks about there being 600,000 souls, 
by six corresponding to 600,000 Israelites that were in the desert or that were men of fighting age. Okay, we should be clear about that. And um, uh, all of the souls who are going to emerge subsequently come from uh, these different aspects of that original Adam. And that they're and they're going to take that very seriously because what they imagine, the way in, according to their system, is that ultimately what we want to do is we want to restore ourselves to that originary position. It's as if everything got fragmented after the first sin, after the golden calf, subsequent you know catastrophes that have happened, that our souls are now fractions of fractions of those original 600,000. And the, for the Kabbalists, our primary task is to reconstitute that original Adam. Um, I'm not seeing anybody else's faces, but please, you know, uh, feel free to uh, to go on screen and to uh, raise your hands, ask questions if you'd like. Great. One brave soul so far. Uh, thanks. So um, uh, this, this framework or this particular image is going to be uh, the framework for thinking about where souls come from, where they're going to go, and also thinking in terms of there being a hierarchy that maybe, maybe I originated from like God's baby toe, okay? I come from a really inferior position within, sorry, within Adam, the, the primordial Adam's uh, structure, but maybe it's possible for me to move up a level. You know, maybe I can bump, get myself bumped up to God's knees, or God's hips, or God's waist, or some such thing. And that's going to be part of what we're going to be looking at. Okay, let's move along. Two more important terms that we're going to we need to be thinking about. Uh, one is uh, revolute is Gilgul, which sorry, one is Gilgul, which could be. Uh, translated as revolution, I think is probably better translated for our uh, perspective tonight as uh, as uh, reincarnation and reincarnation in a very literal sense, right? The word carne means flesh. So reincarnation means taking on a new body, that a soul gets recycled. We saw that from the Bahir last week, right? The early Kabbalistic text from the 12th, maybe 13th century. I see something in the chat, hold on. Ah, that's a great question. Uh, um, so the, uh, in the, in Maimonides this, and from the sources of Maimonides is drawing on uh, both the Arab philosophers that mediate Aristotelian philosophy and the ancient Greeks do not draw distinctions between female and male souls. Um, in the early Kabbalists, we don't see um, a strong distinction. Uh, by the time that we get to 16th century, there is a distinction, right? So there's an evolution of thinking that takes place as these ideas get uh, further developed. Okay, so coming back to our terms here, the term Gilgul, uh, revolution or reincarnation, and Ibur, which literally means pregnancy. Um, it's a funny term to use. And what it's, and if what Gilgul is about, if reincarnation is about taking on a new body, what Ibur is about is about an, a, a foreign soul coming into the body of somebody who already has a soul. You get that's an additive, like taking vitamins, except that hopefully it's going to be better than just vitamin C. It's like, you know, you're going to get Rabbi Akiva jumping into you or Avram Avinu jumping into you or something along those lines. Okay. Let's go on here. Okay. So here we've got a... Um, a citation, a quote from Chaim Vital. Chaim Vital, as I mentioned, is the um, lead student or the lead transmitter, let's say, of Isaac Luria in the 16th century. Um, 
you can see he lived to a relatively, you know, ripe age for uh, the early modern period. He was 77 when he dies. And um, he spent a big chunk of his life living in Svat. Uh, sometime after the Ari dies, after the Arizal dies, he go moves up into Syria. These days we think about Syria as being uninhabitable and, and dictatorial, but there was a there were thriving communities and metropolises uh, in Syria at that time. And there, out of the many books that he that he wrote or that he began to edit from the teachings of Isaac Luria, um, the one that deals with reincarnation uh, extensively is Sha'ar Gilgulim, the gate of revolutions or of reincarnations. And he says, a well-known matter in the words of our rabbis, quote, the, the spirits, the ruchot or nishamot of righteous people come and impregnate a person in the mystery that is called Ibur, to assist him in the service of God. May his name be blessed. As is said in the Zohar regarding one who comes to purify himself, they assist him. Okay, let's just take a, a look at the continuation of this, and then we're going to unpack it. And uh, there it says, uh, Rabbi Natan said, the souls of the righteous come to help him. And again, as it says in the Zohar, regarding Rav Hamnun Asaba, that he came to Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Abba in the form of a donkey driver. Now, I don't think that Rav Hamnun Asaba looked exactly like this donkey driver, but I was looking at images of donkey drivers today, and um, and there was something that, that was attractive about this about this particular image, partly because uh, partly because of the poverty of it, and partly because of the sort of um, uh you know the, it evokes an image of the lowest possible caste is here is somebody that is like is a cab driver basically with a you know uh literally a cab driver uh with a donkey and uh what a, a donkey driver would do is he would move a donkey along to um to um carrying people's bags and such like and he, it continues, it should be known what happens to the nefesh that alone was already rectified without its ruach. The mystery of the matter is that according to the level of refinement and the level of rectification of this nefesh, on that level itself, the nefesh of a righteous person will revolve into the body of this person while he is alive. Okay, let's, let's go back and uh, and unpack a little bit, more, and then we'll come back. We'll move ahead again. Because I want to take a look at this first piece where it's talking about how the the, the ruach or a neshama of a, uh, of a righteous person can come and impregnate a person uh, or, you know, can come to inhabit a person. And uh, so I, I see Oz, Ozzy's, you know, comments in the chat is that um, it is uh, it is exactly the opposite of an exorcism. And these are teachings, the teachings of exorcisms develop in exactly the same intellectual milieu. Robert Yosef Karo, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, uh, performed an exorcism. Uh, Chaim Vital performed at least one or two exorcisms. Um, and this starts to become a popular thing at that time. But for the righteous or for the capitalists, rather than trying to expel a, a foreign soul that has invaded, and when it, in those situations, one's trying to expel a dangerous soul, a sinful soul that has invaded, what the capitalists are trying to do is induce a righteous soul to come in to help them, to help them do mitzvot, to help them learn Torah. And, I mean, there's there's a... Um, it's a practice my wife has when she lights candles uh, uh, before Shabbat. And she asks for blessings from her uh, from her mother and from her grandma and from her grandmothers, all of whom have passed. And while she is not trying to induce their souls to come into her to help her perform mitzvot or the like, there is there is a certain kind of commonality. Uh, uh, between these two, but 
for these Kabbalists, we're talking, we're, they're dead serious uh, about this and, and quite literal about this notion that somehow the soul of Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, of Yitzchak Avinu, Yaakov Avinu, whoever, David Melech, is going to come in and somehow is going to assist me in my work here on earth. So let's come back now, uh, where it says that it should be known what happens to the nefesh that, that alone was already rectified without its ruach. So in other words, first what happens is that a nefesh, you know, we saw the three different stages, first a nefesh will get, will get raised up. So it says the mystery of the matter is that according to the level of refinement, level of rectification of this nefesh, on that level itself, the nefesh of a righteous person will, will revolve into the, the body of this person while he is alive, right? So if your nefesh still needs to needs some fixing, that's what you're going to get. You know, like when you get take your car in for repairs uh, and you tell them that you're having a problem with the brakes, so they don't go about changing the oil. They start off with the brakes or they start, you know, if you say it's a transmission, they start with the transmission. But there's a, a clear pecking order is that you have to start off with your nefesh. Now, one who has already completed his rectification and revolutions, having no further need to revolve, will enter the nefesh of this righteous person, and that will function as a ruach for the nefesh of this living person. So look at what's happened. Is we've got some guy, and he has now, um, you know, he's graduated a little bit, and he's now gotten a ruach. But where is this ruach, this higher rank, coming from? It is the nefesh of another righteous person that is that has come into him. Okay, so now we've got like multiple. You know, if you were um, suffering from a, a a psychological illness, you might be described as having MPD of having multiple personality disorder with this kind of stuff going on. But this is actually something the Kabbalists want, is they want the benefit of having somebody else's uh, soul or components of their soul uh, coming in to us. The text continues, sometimes it's possible that nefeshot of earlier generations will revolve there. Going back to our father Avraham, peace be upon him, or similar souls, it will be based upon the rectification and refinement of the nefesh of this living person. So it depends on who you are and how righteous you are, right? So maybe you'll get, you know, uh, maybe you'll get Yehuda, you know, to uh, to come in, or maybe you'll just get done, right? Is is done was considered to be sort of like the schlepper among the tribes. Uh, there was like nasty things that got said about about the tribe of Don. So hopefully, no, I don't know is there anybody here named Don? No, I think we're all right. Um, so. Um, you know, there's different different levels of assistance that one's going to get. You know, if you're an athlete and you're trying out for the Olympics, you want to get the best coach that you can. And uh, and but if you're like in a you know uh, a low level tier uh, sports league, you're not going to get as good a coach. Similar kind of a, a dynamic. Okay, so going a little further. This is still continuing in the first two chapters of uh, Rabbi Chaim Yitzhak's Shar Hagil Balim. The matter of revolving during a lifetime is called by the rabbis mystery of Ibur. And this is the difference between a regular revolution, Gilgul, and Ibur. Sometimes it's actually possible for a ruach of a righteous person to be an Ibur in a living person. Okay, so first we saw that, well, the nefesh of a righteous person will come in, and that will serve as your ruach. But sometimes their ruach might come into you, and then what happens? And that can also be from the ruchot of earlier righteous people, including the avot whose souls are in, a, in the Garden of Eden. And he, he says, even in our late period in history, right, in the 1500s, it all depends upon the level of the mitzvot performed by this living person. Some mitzvot have the inherent ability to draw down the nefesh of a righteous person, mystery of Ibor, and some mitzvot can draw down the ruach of a righteous person. Okay, so um, you know when we uh, we're done with this with with class tonight, 
you all want to get out there and and get your you know get doing some mitzvot so that you'll get to uh, have not just a nefesh come in but a ruach come in. Further, it is also possible that sometimes it will occur that the nefesh of a righteous person will be an ibur in him, and after that he'll merit an ibur of another nefesh from a different righteous person greater than the first. Okay, so you can get an upgrade. You know, this is like, you know, if you get enough mileage on your airline uh, credit card, then uh, you qualify for automatic upgrades. So you might even be able to get, you know, on my uh, uh, my MasterCard with American Airlines, I'm able to get once a year a um, a free ticket for, a, for, for uh, somebody to accompany me in the 48 states. Okay, it's a pretty good deal. And, and I also qualify to get upgrades sometimes. So I get to get both somebody, one person to come in, I get my own personal upgrade. And here we're seeing something that is, I mean, these are sort of banal um, analogies, but I'm just trying to give a sense that how they're the same kinds of mechanics of things that we want we see them operating here in this spiritual sense. So continuing with that, that particular example, thus he will have his own nefesh, and the nefesh of the righteous person who first came to him will serve as a ruach for him. The second nefesh of the greater righteous person which came to him last will be the dimension of neshama for him. Okay, so we might have thought, well, wait a second, don't I have my own nefesh and ruach and neshama? So if we were to go back to the Zohar, we would see that in, that in fact, uh, everybody starts off with the nefesh. And then in some passages, it says, well, you, if you merit it at your, bar, at your bar mitzvah, at the age where you reach majority, then you get a neshama. But in other texts, it appears that maybe you still don't get a neshama. Maybe you're going to have to work even further for it. But even then, it's your ruach. It's your neshama. Here we've gotten into a whole different place where there is this, this uh, highly variegated superstructure that they're operating with. And they're imagining that what we're going to be drawing down different kinds of spiritual forces uh, to inhabit us. So... Let's uh, continue. Sometimes the nefesh of a person will be rectified so much that he'll merit to achieve the nefesh of a particular righteous person. And after that, he himself will actually reach the level of a ruach of a particular righteous person greater than both of them. Until it is possible to reach the ruach of our father Abraham, peace be unto him. And this is the mystery of what they have written in Midrashim, specifically Midrash Shmuel, which is an, a late medieval Midrash. There isn't a generation in which there is not someone like Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Shmuel, etc. And then he stops. And he says, but the pen does not have the power to put all these fine details in a book. And the enlightened one will understand and infer the consequent divisions and details. Now, I just want to show you something. Here's the book. Okay. This is not a skinny book. And I would just want to show you the inside so you can see. Let's see, where, where's the camera here? I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. There it is. Uh, let me open over here. You can see the level of density that there are in these pages. So it's not so much that he doesn't have the energy to write stuff. It's that he's gotten to the point where he doesn't want to reveal anymore, that he feels that he's already revealed enough esoteric material. Any questions or comments at this point? Yeah, you don't. Hey, yeah, it, it uh, did, unfortunately, simultaneously line up with the pasta beeping. <laughs> but um, so do we exactly know how, what, like the mechanics of the help are? Like, I, I know we said like Misayin Oto, and it seems to be like the imagery is... Adam Kadbonesque of like traveling up the mythic body or something to Avraham. Yes, yes exactly. So yeah. well, well, okay. So so there's there's different things that are taking place. One is that 
in the Adam Kadmon, in the primordial Adam. And what Yehuda is referring to is that in the Midrash that I showed you from Shmot Rabbah, there it seems to be talking about Adam, you know, the guy that was that God created. At this point in Kabbalah, when they talk about the primordial Adam, they're talking about the first array of divine energies uh, into, that God in, uh, instilled in the world and that appear in the image of a human. And that's the primordial Adam. It is a divine or quasi-divine entity. It's a kind of a divine holograph. And within that holograph, are all of our souls. So one thing that happens is that in the, these little you know snippets we've been looking at is we've mostly been drawing down on souls, on, on a nefesh or a ruach or a neshama that occupies different stations on Adam Kadmon. But what we just saw in that last slide was that part of what we're also trying to do is we're also trying to rise up. And the truth is, is that through a series of Gilgulim, because these, these guys imagine that we're going to go through you know, many different Gilgulim until we ultimately attain uh, the, the station that we are destined to. And so it really is like we're clawing our way up along the, the ladder of Adam Kadmon, of the primordial Adam. Is that, that's very clarifying, but I, is, it, is that like something essential to like, is it like an engine or something that like when you have, when you're paired up with this, like tzaddik's ruach, nefesh serving as ruach, or is it that like the assumption is that this will like help you in your divine service, and then by being helped in your divine service, then like you're meriting to ascend. So, with with Luriana Kabbalah, it's very hard to give a definitive answer, and and the easiest way I think to answer your question is to say yes. Mm -hmm. um, in other words. Uh, that it, you know that it's both because and we've already seen both just in these little snippets that it seems that part of what they're trying to do is they're going to be helping you but i think that part of what they do is once you have established a connection with them it's as if you've gotten in a private elevator you know and they you know they're your private elevator operator and once you've drawn them in they just you know when you, in your lifetime you've now been bumped up a level mm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and I, I should just, let me just point out one more thing about this practice. Is there's a book that came out by Tzvi'i Shalom a couple of years ago, Sleep, Death, and Rebirth, um, uh, Mystical Practices of Luriana Kabbalah. And specifically what it talks about is the ways in which during the course of sleep, we can uh, try to speed up our, uh, these Gilgulim these these ascents these you know uh elevator operating operations and the appendix has the uh has the specific kabbalistic practices that one has to uh that one has to practice in order to speed up you can sort of jump ahead a, 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 a few cycles it's like on an old car mine there was a turbo button i could press you know and that would help to you know get me better um uh to get better speed uh, from the car. Okay. Um, let's. Uh, I want to just take another couple minutes with this, and I want then I want to move on to the next topic. So it says when a nefesh and ruach revolve together and have been rectified. Okay, these are two low, lower levels, but are unable to acquire their neshama until another revolution. A nefesh or ruach or neshama of a particular righteous person can enter with them. And yeah, so is the dimension of neshama for them. Hello? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so so here, I mean, we're just sort of getting like another aspect of the same dynamic, right? The, the first two parts have been rectified. So now we're going to call uh, a, you know, a neshama in who is going to, or some other aspect of a righteous person, and that will then serve as a neshama for you you okay so in each one of these cases it's a little bit like what was that game show where you could ask for help you know from uh you would get like a couple of options where you could ask for help uh from somebody so it's that same kind of thing 
right? Is that, uh, you know, you're doing pretty well, but you, you want a little bit more help. Okay, I want to move on to the, uh, the next uh, topic. And yeah, because I've got I've got 37 slides here. So uh, we're going to move along. Hold on. So the next the next piece that I want to be taking a look at is what I've called transformation of reality in Torah Hashmitot. Okay, so this is going to uh, call for a little bit of uh, explanation. Let me say first of all that uh, for most of us when we see the word Shemitah, we think of the sabbat the agricultural sabbatical year, right? That is uh, observed in the land of Israel once every seven years. One is supposed to let the land lie fallow. One's not allowed to perform agricultural work. Um, <clears throat> and um, but for the Kabbalists, the idea of shmitot of the shemitah becomes something dramatically different. It becomes something metaphysical and cosmic and we are no longer talking about units of of uh seven years but much bigger uh periods of time so let's take a look so the first thing is is there the talmudic basis for looking at a concept of shemitot that's different than every seven years rav katina says six thousand years is the duration of the world and it is in ruins for 1,000 years, okay? So you got 6,000 and 1,000, right? We got six days of work, and we got Shabbat. We got six years of agricultural labor, and then a sabbatical year. Uh, the duration of the period during which the world is in ruins is derived from a verse, as is stated, and the Lord alone should be exalted on that day, and the day of God lasts a 1,000 years. Abaye says, he gives a different op opinion. It's in ruin for 2,000 years, etc. Okay, so what's going on here? We don't get a lot of comments in the Talmud about cosmic reality uh, or about grand historical periods. Uh, this is one of the few. Rav Katina is not like doesn't make regular appearances, um, and he is making this, you know, statement that the world that we know is, will last for six thousand years. And then that'll be it. And then it'll just be a Shem. It'll just be God. Everything is going to be nullified. And perhaps it's it's partly a take on the line that we say at the end of Elenu. You know, by Yomahu Yad Nayachad Ushmoachad, that at the that on that day God will be one and God's name will be one. And that's all there will be. Okay. So um so that's the this is the Talmudic basis for the Kabbalistic teaching that we're going to talk about in just a moment. So the Gemara continues, it is taught in a bright in accordance with the opinion of Rav Katina, just as the sabbatical year abrogates debts once in seven years, so too the world abrogates its typical existence for a thousand years, in every 7,000 years, as it is stated. And, and the Gemara continues. Now, from that last line, it appears that Rav Katina believes, or at least the way that the Brita is explained is uh, in accord with Rav Katina, is that this six thousand year period and one thousand year period is not just a one off, that this is a regular occurring cycle that we go through seven thousand years and another seven thousand years and another seven thousand years. Um, <clears throat> you know, and in in the course of Jewish history, so people have gotten very excited at the end of different millennia. Right, so the beginning of the last millennium, according to the Hebrew calendar, was in the year 1240. That was the year 5000. Okay, we're now in 57, uh, 5784. Um, none of us, I imagine, will be around uh, at the beginning of the next, uh, beginning of the next millennium. But I imagine there will be lots of excitements uh, at that at that point as well. Kabbalistically, though. Uh, yeah, let's just go back here for a second. Okay, uh, let's take a look at one more piece uh, from the Gemara, and then I'll tell you what the Kabbalists teach about this. The school of Eliyahu taught 6,000 years is the duration of the world. 2,000 of the years are characterized by chaos, 2,000 by Torah, and 2,000 are the period of the coming of the Mashiach. 
And so now you can see why the year 5000 was so exciting, right? Is that people will be in the, at, we're thinking, well, here we are. It's the beginning of that fifth millennium. That should be the time that the, perhaps the beginning of the messianic era. And of course, the Gemara goes on to say, that's the course that history was to take, but due to our sins, that time frame increased. Okay, so it pours, you know, it's kind of a wet towel on uh, on those hopes. What do the Kabbalists say about Shemitot? Here's where things get uh, get pretty wacky. The way that the Kabbalists imagine the um, these seven thousand year cycles is that there are going to be seven seven thousand year cycles. And each one of them is characterized by one of the spherodes, okay, by one of the seven gradations of divinity. Um, and so the first, uh, the first Shemitah cycle, the first 7,000 year period uh, was characterized by the sphere of Chesed. The second was the, the, the Shemitah of Lura, the third of Tiferet, and so on. And what is distinctive about this teaching is that um, it's not just that there's more chesed, you know, more loving kindness, or that there's more gvura, meaning more judgment or more toughness or, or you know, uh, or rigor or etc. But all of reality is different. It's not just that there's a an increase or a decrease of something. The entirety of reality is different. So much so that even the Torah is different, that each one of these different Shemitot cycles has its own Torah. So there's a Torah from the Shemitah of Chesed. There's a Torah from the Shemitah cycle of Gvura, and so on. And which Shemitah cycle do you imagine that they say that we are in? We are in the Shemitah cycle of Gvura. So let's think about that for a minute. If what Gvura is about is it's about rules, it's about things being understood in terms of right and wrong, it's about harsh judgment, it's about punishment, then on one hand, you know, Jews through history might have said, okay, you know what? It's like this is the the, the Shemitah of Gvura, we're having a hard time. And but there will be a better time, and there was a better time. But if there's a different Torah, then what that what is that going to lead people to do? It's going to lead them to think about well, what is that Torah of Chesed? What was that Torah like? What will the next Torah be? You know, that sounds like that might be a better Torah. That might be a more attractive Torah, a more loving Torah than the one that we've got. And so now what we've done is we've really sort of disrupted the stability or the status quo of what we think reality is, of what Torah is. And that's going to have an impact as well on the question of what it means to, to have a Gilgal, for us to be reincarnated, for our souls to go into another body. And one question, of course, that will come up will be, well, could I be reincarnated into the next Shemitah cycle, right? It's like, it's pretty rough here in Gvura right now. It's like, well, maybe I'll make it into the, into the Shemitah cycle at Tiferet. Maybe I'll get, make it to the one of Shechina, you know, 40-something uh, thousand years from now, right? So it creates a whole different sets of, uh, different sets of expectations can get brought up with this kind of teaching. So part, this fellow, sorry, this fellow, Rav Yosef Ashkenazi, is not a, so well-known a Kabbalist. Um, he uh, is the author of a number of works. Uh, one is a commentary on, uh, a Kabbalistic commentary on Bereshit Rabbah. Um, and, but what might be better known is that if people are familiar with the, with uh, Sefer Yitzirah, the Book of Formation, um, there is a commentary, there's a, there's a lot of commentaries in the traditional edition. And one of the commentaries says that it was written by the Rivet by the Rabbad, Avram ben David, who's perhaps best known for his commentary on the Rambam's Mishnah Torah. Well, it's been 
it's been demonstrated this commentary does not come from Avram ben David, but rather it comes from this same Yosef ben Shalom Ashkenazi. Uh, and he is he is somewhat in sync with the time that the Zohar is written, perhaps a little later. So we're talking about late 1200s, early 1300s in Spain. And what is unique about Ashkenazi's approach is that he really talks about upending the hierarchical categories of nature. So in one text, he says, death itself is sustaining. It provides sustenance for a, di for a different species. Thus, if you say that one type of vegetation becomes desiccated and raises up worms, behold, there is death for the plant, but it returns, the life returns to a living creature. Or conversely, meat that rots loses its freshness, and then a plant grows from it. Right. So just like in our in, in the way the cycles of nature of birth and death, he's he's suggesting that he, he's noticing that new things can grow. I mean, very often people will go to cemeteries and they'll say, um, I don't know, I've heard people say, oh, I'm so glad that this tree is being nourished by, you know, my Aunt Sadie, uh, as it were. Right. There will be like a tree growing nearby or, you know, and and there's now lots of talk about green burials is there's that same kind of impulse, a sense of like, is it, there's continuity, but it's a different kind of continuity. And he, that text continues similarly from a speaking creature, that is a human, going into every kind of species. Similarly, from living creatures and from vegetation and from rocks or inanimate, inanimate objects, angels, spheres, stars, and constellations, and similarly, in the world of the spheroid. And each and every one has its own order for ascent and descent. Okay, so this is a very dramatic claim, right? That it's, you know, we sort of tend to think of ourselves as big as an environmentalist as you might be. Well, I, 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 sh I shouldn't make that claim, but, but we tend to think of ourselves as being the top of creation, right? That's sort of like a Western assumption. And what he's saying here is in this world, we're the top, we may be the top of creation, but we're it's not static. We're gonna die. We may move up, we may move down, we may come back as a star, we may come back as an ant. And what that does, and this is really the point of the whole course right, in call, calling it the fluidity, fluidity of identity, is it maybe, is it helps us to rethink, or perhaps it breaks open a little bit, cracks open a little bit, our sense of our own stability, the sense of the staticness of our own identity in this cosmos. We all know that we're going to die. We don't know what's going to happen after that. We know we hope for something. But, um, but here the suggestion is, is it's all part of one big fabric. And we don't know where we're going to get moved around. So in a different passage, he's he'll play this out slightly differently. And he says, uh, when the Lord God made earth and heaven, this means that one day enters and another goes. That is to say that a sphera, a sphera serves for an hour and returns serves for a day and returns, serves on Shabbat and returns, serves for a month and returns, serves for a year and returns, and serves for a sabbatical, for a Shemitah, right? That's what I was saying, is that, is that each Shemitah cycle will have its own sphera, its own aspect of divinity that it, it enacts, and its own kind of reality that it enacts. Serving, right, because he said that it serves for a day, signifies that a day and a sphera that begin are called sovereign at the time that the sun begins to rise. And here it's using sunrise in a metaphorical sense. And the enlightened one will understand from their names who rules in each and every Shemitah, whether it is the human over other faces or other faces over the human. Okay, so... You know, really what we're talking about now, I mean, I saw a trailer a couple nights ago for, you know, the new Planet of the Apes movie. 
right? And it, it starts off and it says, well, the humans used to be very evolved and, you know, and they destroyed everything. And, and now it's us and now we're going to have to grow. And Lahavati, that's exactly what's taking place here is that in, in a different, you know, version of reality, things are going to shift. So I don't know if people have seen, uh, I mean, there's sort of an early version of this idea you could see in uh, the Spider-Man, uh, you know, through the multiverse, uh, you know, uh, movies, um, but done in a, a much more profound way in everything, everywhere, all at once, where the, the lead character, you know, has existed or does exist in multiple dimensions all at the same time. Now here in these Kabbalistic texts, we are talking chronologically. There'll be 7,000 years, then another 7,000 years. Um, but I think that what that movie was getting at that's very similar to this is a sense of, we might we can occupy lots of different kinds of realities. In that movie, it was like all at the same time in different dimensions. But here for these Kabbalists, it's like the, the life that you're leading right now it could be totally different next time, next time around. Now, how do these things happen? Part of it is the effects of sin. And he writes, the cow obeys the plower because the face of the human rules over the other faces. Okay, now what he's thinking about here is he's thinking about the four faces on Ezekiel's chariot. One, and there, there are four, there are four heads on the four creatures. Uh, that support the chariot. And each of those four heads has four faces, one of which is the human, which is ideally supposed to be leading the chariot. Um, but he, and he says, once a person sins, the cow or the ox rebels against the plower because the human sinner has descended below the human that is in the ox. And therefore the ox rules over him. Let's unpack this for a moment. What he's imagining is that somehow, if we are all part of a single fabric, that there may be a hierarchy of beings, but that sometimes that hierarchy can get upended, such that the animal part of us rises rises higher. Now, we might say, oh yeah, well, we're familiar with that. That's like the eights of hurrah, right? And we can call that the animal part of us, but the difference is that there's a whole system that's being imagined here of how this takes place. And it's a somewhat carefully worked out, sort of almost quasi-scientific metaphysical system of where you are on these different stages of evolution. So one of the things that happens is a kind of intermingling of species. Um, and he says... For the human has intellect from the supernal ones, and he is the completion of the supernal ones. That is the intellects. You may remember we were talking about different intellects that cause the different spheres to move. It was coming from, uh, we were talking about that with Maimonides and with Abu Lafia. And here we're still working with the same kind of astronomical system where each planet is embedded in a sphere, and each sphere is caused to move by an intellect. Um, and so uh, Ashkenazi is saying, for the human has intellect from the supernal ones, means angelic beings, and he is the completion or the, the final stage of the supernal one, ones, that is the intellects. And he is, he is first of all existence below the sphere of the moon, according to the mystery of Gilgul and Shalach. For it is, and I'll explain that term in a second. For it is through him that the intellects descend, and through him all other existence shall ascend. Okay, so in the scheme of uh, of uh, Ashkenazi, a, the Gilgul is when there is a particular form, uh, material form, uh, gets changed multiple times. And what Shalach is, is when the soul moves through different kinds of stages. So one is about material reconstitution, another is about spiritual reconstitution. But here again, what he's trying to, what he's emphasizing is that it's 
through the human beings, the human being, because we are part of that chain of intellects, that ladder of intellects, that things from above can move downward, things from below can move upward. Now, you can well imagine where we're headed. And, and that is that he says, since the human species and its species comprises all existence, it can be exchanged for all species and, and species of existence, and not only the human, but indeed all living creatures, vegetation, and inanimate entities, indeed all existence that are renewed. So the first is what's important, most important here are these first two lines. Since the human species comprises all existence, it can be exchanged for all species of existence, okay? In other words, imagine that contained within me are dogs and cats and pigs and horses and, and rocks and plants, etc. It's in some kind of essential spiritual sense. And given that that's the case, it's a little bit like talking about stem cells, right? To so the extent that cells can be stem cells can be turned into any kind of into into any kind of cell. So to here, we can be moved around anywhere on this on this scale. We can be moved up, and other things can, or, or down, and we can and other things can be moved up. He continues, know that the human has a soul that is a mixture and soul of the vegetative and soul of the living creatures and intellectual soul. Consequently, all creatures can plow and operate within a person because he has the power of them all. He has the capacity to transmit, migrate into any inanimate entity, vegetative, living, and intellectual, into the spheres, the stars, the constellations, the intellects, the angels, and the essence of the ten spherot. So to give perhaps a, a comical example, is I, I'm Canadian originally. I grew up in Toronto. Uh, we had a prime minister during the uh, Second World War named Mackenzie King. Um, Mackenzie King um, imagined that his mother had or his mother had died, and that she had been reincarnated into his dog, and so he had regular conversations with his dog. Um, I don't know whether the dog made good decisions for Parliament, you know, during those years, but. Um, uh, perhaps to speak a little bit more, to be a little more serious for a moment, is that part of what he he is trying to get us to imagine is that we have a an impulse, we humans, to think of ourselves as being very important. And what he's trying to argue is we're we're part of like this this cosmic this cosmic uh, text, this this cosmic textile, if you will, and this fabric, and we can be moving around inside of it. And um, we can be doing that for good, we can be doing that for ill, but the possible ramifications of, of this, uh, this line of reasoning is that we should be giving much more respect and treating with greater care, not just the people around us, but really everything around us. Because in some sense, it is all us. And with that, uh, I'm going to have to say thank you uh, for coming out for the last few weeks. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, I'm, I, uh, I have to run off to go pick up a kid at an art class half an hour away. But uh, if people want to shoot me email questions, uh, you know, then I'm happy to take them. Okay, so uh, best wishes to you all and, um, and give kavod to everything. Have a good night. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, you bet.